Thank you very much. And um, I don't mind if anybody does a practical while we're doing this talk. I'm well used to doing talks where I see the eyes gently rolling as I give my talk. So I'd like to thank the organisers for um, allowing me to come and talk to you about um, the interaction between sleep, recovery and performance. So my background is that I'm based at Imperial College and I work at um, the Royal Brompton Hospital with patients that have difficulty breathing during sleep. I guess one of the reasons why I'm stood here is because I've also done a postdoctoral training in Madison, Wisconsin and um, have been a subject for many of the experiments that you've been talking about over the last couple of days. So in starting to prepare to give this talk and talk to you about the relationship between sleep and recovery, one of the things that was interesting for me is like, well, why now? Because there's many, many um, researchers that work in exercise, uh, performance, elite athletes. But it's an interesting thing, certainly in this country, that there are very few people who work in sleep and even less that interact between sleep and exercise. So if there's one thing for you to remember, if you like, before you fall asleep during my talk, is that one of the things that we need is much more data in this area in order to be able to understand exactly what is going on um, in the interaction. So a lot of you will have read these stories about Roger Federer. He's been at the top of his athletic um, game, if you like, for many years. And um, he's reported to be one of the athletes who is absolutely meticulous about how much sleep he gets. And it's also interesting that he's now talking about the fact that sometimes he can't get as much sleep as he wants to, and also that he feels that the sleep itself is, is giving him the recovery, but he's not quite sure that his sleep is um, as good as it was. And one of the interesting things for me, because my area of research is ageing, is what um, actually happens to sleep as you get older. And um, again, listening to some of your presentations over the last couple of days, it, it's interesting for me that nobody thinks about what's happening um, to their um, subjects while they're um, not in the lab doing the experiments. So I'll get to that in a minute. But I think that thinking about the period when you're um, uh, athletes, if you like, are actually not with you training, might be of value. So what I'm going to cover for those of you that are not um, deeply involved in the sleep field is actually what sleep is, what factors influence sleep, the interaction between sleep and circadian rhythm. Um, interesting that we can measure circadian rhythm much better than we can measure sleep. The acute and chronic effects of sleep loss, the role of what I think sleep might be doing to the brain, and um, we're probably going to end up with more questions than answers. So um, if we look at what sleep is, um, it's almost uh, sure that every species that's been studied so far has some form of sleep or quiescence. And I've put up the fruit fly because it's genetically one of the um, animals that we're working with most in the sleep field. And um, Alan Rex Jaffin from Chicago, who developed the criteria for scoring sleep, said that if sleep doesn't form some vital function, it's probably the biggest mistake that evolution ever made. But there are animals that sleep differently. And um, some of you will know about um, dolphins, which sleep with hemispheric sleep. They sleep with half their brain at a time. And the reason that I put the echidna up is because it um, um, occupies this niche where, okay, I don't think the point is working, but never mind. Um, it occupies a niche where um, it, it's an egg-laying mammal, and so um, was thought for some time to be a unique link between birds and, um, uh, and mammals. And people got very excited because echidnas don't have REM sleep, and so they don't dream very much, and so that was thought to be one of um, the evolutionary models for um, how REM sleep and the value of REM sleep. But in fact, uh, it's probably now been recorded that there are little bits of REM sleep in echidnas. So 
One of the questions that everybody asks is what is, what is sleep, what's it for? So for those of you that aren't familiar with sleep, you sleep on about a 90 minute cycle. So when you get to bed, you fall asleep. You should fall asleep within about five and 10 minutes and you will fall asleep into very deep sleep. And then as you um, have been asleep for about 90 minutes, you'll come up, you'll have a short period of REM sleep. You'll then go back down into your second stage of sleep and um, you will then have a lighter sleep. Your REM sleep gets longer as you go through the night and your um, deep sleep gets less. And I've put up the electroencephalogram, the EEG, from um, a sleeping subject and you'll see from top to bottom that, um, that the, um, that the um, EEG is much um, uh, lower uh, amplitude, faster frequency. And as you get to the bottom of the chart, um, it's much of a higher amplitude and lower frequency. And it's the deep sleep that's thought to have the metabolic restorative effects. And then you'll see the trace um, along the bottom, which is the rapid eye movement sleep, which looks very like wakefulness. And there's lots of discussion at the moment about whether REM sleep has a particular function in terms of memory consolidation, um, as opposed to the deep sleep having um, a, a different kind of memory, emotional um, uh, uh, reasons for, for uh, being there. So that's what the actual sleep patterns look like, but that is a sleep pattern for a um, relatively young subject. And as you get older, sleep changes, but there are also many other things that will modulate sleep. So on the top uh, left panel, you've got the delta activity from a young subject versus an older subject. And in orange, you'll see that the amplitude of the deep sleep is much less in the older subject compared to the younger subject. You'll also see um, that there's a plot up there where I've shown arousal against age. And that's to show you that there are multiple short arousals that occur during the night. Most of the time you just wake over up, you roll over, you don't worry about it. But every now and again you'll wake up and then some of you will have difficulty in falling back to sleep. But as you get older, those frequent arousals increase. So aging is one of the key things that changes our sleep patterns and it also changes your circadian rhythm, which I'll show you in a minute. It actually pushes you to um, go to bed earlier and wake up earlier. Uh, gender, uh, women are supposed to sleep better than men, but they're supposed to not acknowledge or report that sleep. I'll leave that with you, but that's, the, um, that's what people say. Sleep deprivation, obviously, if you stay up all night, your sleep, will, um, your sleep latency will get shorter and you'll have more deep sleep in preference to REM sleep. Caffeine, most people have that first thing in the morning. That will definitely uh, change your sleep patterns, alcohol and various drugs, both prescribed and non-prescribed. And then there are a whole host of sleep disorders, um, among them, some of them that you will know, narcolepsy, things like jet lag. But the uh, thing that um, is interesting for me is whether um, you um, actually ever check whether your athletes or whether your subjects that you're using have any insomniac tendencies. And it's quite interesting um, to know that it's actually a fair proportion of people in the population that do have insomniac. So um, it's worth just checking with your subjects if they've got any sleep disorders. So I've given you a brief um, outline here of some of the neurotransmitters that are involved in controlling sleep. And I've really just put this up to show you that it's actually an extremely complicated picture. And also to show you that some of the neurotransmitters that you may be interested in from your exercise perspective are also probably having a dual effect during sleep. So we know, for example, that serotonin plays an important part in um, slow wave sleep. And I know from my uh, reading of your literature that there are several papers talking about the impact of exercise on serotonin. And then the one down here that most of you will inhibited with your coffee um, uh, this morning. So there are many different um, neurotransmitters. 
and also to try and show you that sleep is a very active process along the reticular activating form, uh, uh, system. Whereas when you go to, sorry, wait, whereas when you go to sleep, you actually have to inhibit a lot of these pathways to make sleep happen. So if, if you ask one person that has a problem with insomnia, it's because it is actually quite an active and difficult process for your brain to disengage and go to sleep. So just to be aware that there's a complexity of neurons that we're dealing with. And so the question then becomes, what happens if you go in for a period of acute or chronic sleep deprivation? So this is um, my acute sleep deprivation slide. And in the world of sleep, people talk about hypofrontality if you have an acute sleep deprivation period. So some of you will notice some of these symptoms if you've had this situation occur. So you get a definitely a reduced flexibility in thinking. You have an impaired sense of humor. So um, people tend not to find things quite so funny when they've had a sleepless night. You have an increased risk-taking activity. And this is one of the issues, some of the work that I've done has been with altitude and climbers, and they have a particular concern about their sleep loss because of its potential ability to impair their decision making. And poor mental judgment is one of the things that's been shown with acute sleep deprivation. So this is total sleep deprivation, which is causing um, a lot of these uh, cognitive ability. Reduced emotional intelligence and a negative mindset is also something that people frequently talk about with respect to sleep deprivation. And there's an interesting theory that's just recently been put out where people are talking about the role of sleep in terms of its emotion and how it influences your emotion versus the role of sleep with memory. So you'll see that um, in here, they're talking about the REM sleep associated with memory, whereas non-REM sleep being associated with um, emotion. They're actually incredibly difficult studies to do because as soon as you try and REM sleep deprive somebody, you'll also deprive them of their non-REM sleep. So it's, they're, they're really difficult studies to do well and to do well-controlled studies. But it, it, it is interesting for me. I noticed that there was a lot of parallels with the data that I know so well compared with uh, your field. And um, some of the discussions that I was reading around what the influence of exercise is on the frontal lobes read very similar to some of the um, impact of sleep on the frontal lobes. So that interaction between when and how much you should exercise versus sleep deprivation is probably related to the fact that you're activating some of the same pathways. And in particular, I've already alluded to the fact that in some sports, it becomes more critical than others if you've had um, acute sleep deprivation. And in particular, um, from my own experience, I know that um, climbers have particular issues. And of course, they are in very uncomfortable situations as well when they're out on expeditions. So um, very relevant for them to be aware of their sleep. Although interestingly enough, they're also extremely reluctant to take any kind of medication that would help their sleep. So they kind of double whammy there. So in talking about acute sleep deprivation, you don't go very far before you have to distinguish between what's happening with the sleep deprivation versus what's happening with the circadian rhythm. So for those of you that are less clear, um, this is the evidence that I was picking up from um, one night of sleep deprivation affecting treadmill endurance. But the um, multitude of studies were also looking at the impact on the circadian rhythm. So you get this dual process model that people talk about. This is the urge to sleep, um, which uh, reduces as you go through the night. And then during the day, it builds up. So you won't be long before you hit this pale blue area where your urge to sleep is building up and you reach a natural um, uh, uh, point here, if you like, nadir, 
which is shown here about two o'clock, but some people probably experience it a bit later, where naturally you would have a siesta. So mammals are almost, or humans are one of the few mammals that have one period of consolidated sleep. The majority of animals that we um, work with in the lab and that we test have frequent periods of sleep. And we would naturally, left to our own devices, have a little siesta at around four o'clock. That would relieve your sleep pressure, which would then build up again um, uh, during the course of the late evening and would cause you to go to sleep. And this circadian urge here can also be followed with your core body temperature um, and um, is uh, controlled by different factors such as light, etc. So what's the interaction between sleep deprivation and um, the acute influences on the circadian rhythm? And there turns out to be remarkably little data and also remarkably little data that's well controlled. So this is one of the few studies that I could find where they were looking at elite um, gymnasts in this situation. And they were looking at um, uh, coordination tests versus strength tests. And interestingly, these athletes train in the evening. And what they showed in the gymnasts was that um, they showed that in the morning there was very little effect of training, but they got better, these gymnasts got better <laughs> when they were training in the late afternoon. This study was adequately powered. It did have a good control group. Um, but, and the unfit controls showed very little impact of changing and modulating when they did their exercise. And so one of the conclusions of these authors was that potentially the exercise itself was influencing the circadian rhythm rather than the circadian rhythm influencing the exercise. So you've got this reciprocal that if you train repeatedly in the evening, you may actually be changing your circadian rhythm, which I think is something that uh, potentially some of you may be looking at. Um, I know I was talking to somebody from uh, John Moores who was saying that you were thinking of looking at that. But if you drill down and think about why that might be and discuss think for yourself what the impact of the circadian rhythm is. It's obviously controlled by a supercharismatic nucleus. And there's the central clock, which has the neuroendocrine impact. But there's also worth remembering that there are the peripheral clocks, both metabolic, hormonal, um, and uh, potentially associated with the uh, uh, hormones of um, uh, appetite. So for insulin, for example, People have been looking at um, what, what the impact of the circadian clock is on the insulin. And um, one of the ways that now we're able to look at circadian clocks is um, on the animal models. So I've just put up here one of the best animal studies that I think has come out recently. And partly to let you know that there is a symposium on animal models of sleep at the uh, summer physiological meeting in Dublin, which is shared with the American Thoracic Society. And what they've done here is they've taken um, zebrafish and they've, uh, I'm not sure how you exercise a zebrafish, but they've exercised the zebrafish and looked at the expression of the uh, period one and clock genes. And interestingly enough, when they do that, they have shown that there is an exercise mediated change in the core body temperature, which is what they're using as a marker of the circadian rhythm. And because these zebrafish are poikilocapnic, then they cannot be, it cannot be the impact of the exercise that's changing the um, circadian rhythm. So something to think about when you're thinking about your training schedules is that the training schedule may be, it may be possible to actually uh, change the circadian rhythm around. So I was then thinking about, all right, so what are some of the practices that you guys have around training, when you train, etc.? And um, you don't have to go very far in the literature before you start getting um, information about things like cold water immersion and knowing that Mike Tipton's also uh, here at this meeting, I thought I'd go where devils fear to tread and let you know about this study which um, was done in male cyclists. It was done in, um, uh, uh, in Australia. And what they did was they looked at the effect of exercise on the male cyclists 
and they looked at the effect of exercise with cold water immersion without and in a control group. And this is a study where they've actually measured sleep. So they've got the EEG on and they've measured sleep. And they actually showed very little impact of the, um, of the um, uh, condition um, on, the, on, the, um, on the circadian cycle. So very little effect of the cold water immersion. So just summarising your literature going through the different studies that I was able to find, um, there are a number of different studies that have been done. A lot of them have been done with subjective ratings and a lot of them uh, are looking at how to improve those subjective ratings. But on the whole, um, one of the things that I found was that with the objective measures you're finding minimal effect with the subjective measures you are finding some effect. So it might be a little bit the same as um, we were talking about in the previous slide, where if you feel it, it might be okay, but objectively there seems to be minimal effort. But there's certainly many people who are talking about sleep now. It's much more in the literature. So what about the chronic effects of sleep? We talk about it in terms of metabolic, immunological, and um, central, and I will just go through those for you now. In terms of metabolic, this is one of the classic studies that we talk about in the sleep literature, where they took eight subjects and they gave them a constant glucose infusion to look at the impact of sleep and circadian rhythm on insulin secretion. It's an amazing study, eight hours of nocturnal sleep, 28 hours of wakefulness, eight hours of daytime sleep and they took blood samples every 20 minutes. And what they were able to show is in this situation where they controlled for sleep and for the circadian rhythm, they still saw a circadian release of cortisol and it was mirrored by the insulin. So the take home message from this study is that there is a circadian, inherent circadian rhythm to the secretion of um, insulin and it's something that you might want to take note of when you're designing your training schedules. So in terms of um, looking at um, metabolic effect on recovery, again, several studies that I have been able to find from your literature, but there's very little uh, agreement and consensus in these studies. So I went to my literature and just to let you know that we have um, fairly strong data to show that when you do have circadian misalignment with your energy metabolism, such as in night shift working, et cetera, it can cause quite um, profound impact on your ability to intake nutrients and your ability to control your weight. So I just put that up there again as um, an indication of where our two fields might be able to cross over. In terms of the immunological function, I wanted to let you know that in animal studies, we have um, uh, got a series of studies where the authors have actually sleep deprived these animals to death and looked at their metabolic, immunological and skin function. And they've shown that you can sleep deprive the animals to death. But in terms of the markers of um, training and immunological function, I couldn't see any um, a, um, uh, let's say, a coherent story. In terms of CNS, you have got um, many factors that control exercise, but in terms of sleep, we have been looking at how sleep influences the central nervous system, and I'm aware that the time is running out, so I'm going to take you straight to this slide, which is a slide which basically talks about the impact of sleep on neuroplasticity and the fact that if you are unable to sleep or don't sleep well, then you've got much less chance of being able to maintain that neuroplasticity because of a buildup of um, synaptic potentials that's not getting rationalized during sleep. So this is one of the key slides and one of the very uh, cool areas of research that's going on at the moment. You'll see these papers are coming out in Nature Review Science big studies being done now on what the value of sleep is for the central nervous system. So just to kind of put a little flesh on that, these are some lovely studies that have been done 
showing the impact of if you have a, dep a reduction in deep sleep, you have a problem with frontal brain. And I think as we go forward, we'll be able to find out much more about the interaction of sleep on the forebrain. My own area is sleep apnea, and we've looked at that in more detail. And I wanted to say a little moment about sleeping high and um, training low, because I know who, I cut was, who came before me. That's fine, but just be aware that that may well cause intermittent hypoxia during the night, particularly in your older subjects where the hyoid bone moves down and forward and the airway is more compliant. So if you've got subjects training, I know most of your elite athletes are young, but if they're older, please be aware that it may impact not only their upper airway, but also their control of breathing. So in relation to the um, uh, relationship between sleep, recovery and performance, what I hope that I've tried to show you is that sleep is an important determinant of health, certainly in all mammals that have been studied to death today. You can sleep deprive animals to death. Acute sleep deprivation leads to profound effects on cognitive ability and mood, and that there is, does seem to be some evidence in your literature that that does have an effect on athletes, and particularly on um, elite athletes in team sports where there's more data from your literature. There's a clear indication that sleep and circadian rhythm may influence or interact with each other, and I think that's a really exciting area for research. And the role of chronic sleep deprivation on metabolic and immunological function, I think there's less data in your literature on that. And I think probably I would invite you to look at the impact of age. So you never do this work alone, and I'd like to thank the people who've come through my lab and helped with the studies that we've done on the brain and sleep apnea. And I'd like to thank you for your attention. <laughs>